Всем добрый вечер. Сегодня у нас гостевая лекция на английском языке, как я чувствую, из названия Константина Киншу, искусствоведа, куратора, я не знаю, как я произнесу, украинской, американской, не знаю, какого, международного. И остальное, я думаю, лучше нам расскажет сам лектор на английском языке, если я надеюсь, что, как и в случае с Эвой Томпсон, все, все понимают, если какие-то останутся непонятные кому-то, то мы сможем потом пояснить. Так, передаю слово нашему почетному гостю. So, thank you very much for joining this. Uh, I cannot say that it will be lecture. Uh, it could be more a kind of conversation, uh, discussing the situation today, discussing what we are facing. Uh, I hope that it will be provocative enough to, uh, let's say, uh, uh, inspire you to answer questions in the end of this lecture. And uh, let's start with the very definition. Uh, This course is uh, dedicated to, um, uh, let's say, decolonization, uh, in some ways to post-colonial studies, uh, which I have to say openly is a problematic subject. Because post-colonial studies in their contemporary form are uh, quite questionable discipline which is provoking many, many problems. And especially many problems in case when we are starting to talk about uh, the evil empire, uh, the former Russian empire, the former Soviet Union, Russian empire, et cetera, et cetera, because we are in uncharted waters. I already observed with interest some, uh, let's say, misunderstandings occurring uh, during conversation of uh, uh, Ukrainians inspired by decolonization and their Western counterparts. Uh, because let's say American scholars cannot even understand what they are talking about because uh, the question is, but both of you were white and both of us are white. And even this is creating a problem now. Uh, the main question is what we are facing. Uh, of course, it's the third year of the war, but still we are in the realm of emotions. It's very emotional reaction. Uh, I'll name this uh, conversation, uh, Pushkin must fall, Obviously, parodying the famous slogan, the Rodos must fall, uh, which became the um, um, war cry of the campaign in Oxford uh, for um, uh, demolition of the statue of Rhodes. Uh, in Oxford, this situation was developing quite slowly. In Ukraine, uh, the development was very fast. Uh, Pushkin Apad, as it's uh, called today in Ukraine, started in the first weeks of the war. It was provoked by the article uh, written by the director of Ukrainian Institute, uh, uh, Volodymyr Shiko, questioning the whole issue of um, domination of Pushkin in Ukraine. Uh, the, and I think that it was the first, the first um, uh, instigator which started the process. To my taste, we became victims of one very serious problem. Uh, we are not talking about culture as such, we are talking about instrumentalization of culture. And this instrumentalization of culture uh, becoming the scene which we are mistakenly taken as a culture. Uh, you know, Pushkin is a very good example uh, because through centuries, he 
really was Russian everything. Uh, Pushkin was, uh, I don't know, after the October Revolution, uh, Pushkin was canceled as a representative of the, uh, uh, let's say, reactionary uh, feudal circles. Uh, this campaign was going quite long, uh, for quite a long time because uh, the famous uh, cartoonist Maor uh, published his, to my taste, last cartoons depicting Pushkin as a ser servant of monarchy. In, uh, in the magazine called Dayosh, which was quite late uh, uh, constructivist publication. And uh, we are talking about uh, 1928, 1929, when these cartoons appear. Then, of course, um, um, uh, the story changed. Pushkin became um, uh, the main deity of the Russian or Soviet Russian. Uh, cultural pantheon. Everybody knows about uh, 1937 and this um, uh, opulent celebration of the um, uh, uh, <clears throat> Pushkin death, which uh, led to the construction of first monuments uh, uh, all around uh, Soviet Russia and later all around Soviet Union. Because Pushkin was transformed, he became proto-Bolshevik, uh maybe some of you remember a poem of uh, Alexander Bezemensky uh envision in Pushkin at the tribune at the Congress of Young Communist League. You hear on the podium, you are among gas, we are glorifying your Kamsamol May. So Pushkin became Kamsamol member and symbol of Soviet culture. Uh but until the end of the Second World War, monuments to Pushkin were limited by the Soviet borders. After the end of the war, uh, the tradition to mark, let's say, quote unquote, new territories or zones of influence with Pushkin monuments uh, developed very, very fast. And these monuments were signs of uh, not very nice historical uh, uh, events which were awaiting the countries where these monuments were erected. For example, 1949, which is a really another Pushkin year after the Second World War, uh, monument in Weimar, in GDR, which is basically uh, symbolizing the creation of GDR. The same year, Hungary, Budapest, a um, huge memorial plaque of Pushkin put like really on the eve of the full communist takeover of Hungary. Uh, the same year, 48, 49, Romania, two monuments, one erected during the beginning of the uh, collectivization campaign started by Pauker, and another one, one year later in Bucharest. So, uh, what is interesting is that Pushkin is becoming the first sign of Soviet presence. And some uh, somehow playing the role of uh, precursor, uh, let's say, John the Baptist of Stalin. Because in all these places, monuments to Stalin are uh, erected uh, roughly three years later. Uh, so that's the Pushkin of um, uh, Stalinist period. And of course, then uh, this Pushkin, after the fall of Stalinism, changing fully its meaning, and from uh, greatest uh, um, uh, writer of the Soviet pantheon, he's becoming literally a dissident. Uh, you remember Brezhnev days, you remember reception of the 19th century culture, uh, you remember books of Edelman, um, uh, songs of Bulata Kudrava, and attempt of every person who hated the Soviet regime to associate himself with uh, uh, Russian 19th century culture, uh, traditional um, uh, Soviet way to address some historical problems and to mirror them to 
um, contemporary reality, that's another Pushkin. And then, of course, we have the third Pushkin and the third cultural model. But returning to the cultural model, Soviet cultural model of Stalinist period uh, was basically a franchise. It was a great Russian culture with Pushkin on the top uh, of the Pantheon, surrounded by uh, interesting selection of writers, because next to him was sitting uh, Count Leo Tolstoy, whom you could not kick out of there because of the famous Lenin words about the mirror of Russian Revolution. On the other hand of Pushkin were sitting Mayakovsky and Gorky. Uh, maybe some of you who lived in the um, lived in Russia or um, uh, any Soviet Republic remember school buildings with four bar reliefs put on the facade, which were like the short version of the Soviet Pantheon. But then, of course, because it was franchise, every Soviet Republic had to have their own Pantheon. And a uh, perfect example is Ukrainian Pantheon, where Taras Shevchenko was put on the top of the local Mount Olympus. Uh, by the way, Stalinist celebration of uh, Shevchenko's centennial was maybe not as grand as Pushkin's celebration, but grand enough. And then we were walking through the whole list of Soviet republics, every of which had to produce uh national bard maybe you saw the um, you remember the book of Svyosky in the Jewish cemetery at that uh, century uh, where he's paying uh, enough of attention to this cult of bards uh or if bards were not available okay national epic poems uh of course in this peculiar model of culture Every republic of the Soviet Union had to have the, uh, the similar um, uh, archaic, in a sense, classicist uh, structure of this uh, cultural model, which had uh, to be um, supplemented with, I don't know, academic painting, opera as the highest manifestation of um, uh, uh, developed culture. Uh, there is a beautiful text, which is called the uh, Grand Operari in Tau, dedicated to uh, the memoir of a son of a composer, one of the group of composers who were traveling through the Central Asian republics, uh, writing operas in Kazakhstan, in Kyrgyzstan, in every stan. Uh, then this opera is, of course, based on the national epic of poems were performed in Moscow with a great success. And then they were coming back and moving to the next republic to produce national opera. So that was um, uh, a very structured hierar hierarchical system, uh, which after the death of Stalin was not really seriously changed. It did not came through uh, any serious reform with exception uh, of some additions. Let's say Dostoevsky was uh, uh, finally, by the end of the 1950s, 1960s, 60s, added uh, to the um, uh, list of saints of Russian culture. Uh, I think that the best visual manifestation of this cultural model uh, is a painting which was donated by the Soviet Union to the headquarters of UNESCO in Paris and uh, created by such a master as Ilya Glazunov, which is called Russian culture. So if you will have a moment, you look at this painting because uh, like uh, all creations of Glazunov is basically painted montage, but uh, with very interesting hierarchy of sizes. So Pushkin has to be very big, Dostoevsky very big, Taras uh, Shevchenko big enough, but something, somebody like Navai becoming very, very small, still visible, but small. So uh, that's the that, uh, that the Soviet model, and with this Soviet model, we basically came to the end of the Soviet Union. 
with minimal correction, minimal changes. Uh, and what happened afterwards? It's interesting that early Putinist model of culture, to my taste. Uh, of course, big change, um, the Soviet narrative. And uh, step by step, in very fast um, uh, pace, created a kind of all inclusive Russian model. So, everything which was known in Russian culture had to serve the idea of greatness of Russia. And it was uh, really this uh, ideal hill where a lamb and uh, a sheep were resting together. So you could have the everybody. Mikhalkov next to Mandelstam, I don't know, Kalashnikov next to Sakharov. So that's, uh, that had to be demonstration of Russian greatness. All inclusive, all great, all for expert. Uh, just giving nice feeling that all of these people are great sons of Russia. No difference um, uh, even if some of them killed another uh, representatives of this um, uh, hagiography of um, uh, Russian culture. This kept until the beginning of the war in Ukraine. Now we can see cracks in this system and uh, I think that you read in Russian newspapers the situation is changing. And uh, it's uh, going in parallel with rehabilitations or attempts of rehabilitations and strong return. Some um, uh, works of socialist realism, which were somehow forgotten and excluded, even talks about returning to the school program, such masterpieces uh, as a uh, uh, novel of Ostrovsky, and other works of such level. But let's return to so-called decolonization as we can see it now in Ukraine. So as I said, I truly believe that uh, Ukrainian war against Pushkin has a bit of um, uh, initially, uh, has uh, an element of misunderstanding because it's uh, uh, basically a historical emotional reaction not to Pushkin but uh, as I said to instrumentalization of Russian culture which I was discovering right now. So uh, it's interesting that uh, the process which now is described as diversification uh, started in Ukraine only with the beginning of this war which is again stressing its emotional and reactive character. Uh, this process had a uh, few elements. Uh, first, uh, and uh, the most important probably of them, is uh, changing of the names um, uh, <laughs> of street villages, et cetera, et cetera. So this toponymic war, again started on very early stages during the uh, war. Uh, sometimes leading to very parodic and probably not well sought changes. Like uh, for example, uh, in Kyiv, Dostoevsky Street became Andy Warhol Street. In the city of Hust, uh, the street of Leo Tolstoy was changed into Boris Johnson Street. If I could be Boris Johnson, I could write to Ukrainian friends that I am very happy, but maybe it's a bit too much. Uh, or in Kyiv, uh, Marina Tsvitaeva Street uh, turned into Alexandra Exter Street. Uh, anyway, they remained in one time frame. So all these uh, renamings, uh, uh, quite emotional, quite uh, treated as the urgent issue, as also this war with Pushkin and war with um, uh, Russian literature. It's on one's hand, and of course, it's absolutely understandable because uh, 
this cannon was enforced on Ukrainians for very, very long time. Uh, the question is why they did not start to fight with it um, uh, in the beginning of the independence uh, still has to be answered. Uh, so, now we are trying to divide uh, and um, uh, remove, let's say, foreign element of uh, imperialist Russian culture. And in this case, we are coming with a uh, claim that uh, Russians appropriated elements of Ukrainian culture and deprived us of uh, our great, as minimum, artists. I am dealing with art, and I'm curating uh, exhibitions of Ukrainian art now. And uh, it's interesting to see this um, uh, war against appropriation. Uh, maybe you noted that in the beginning of um, 2022, when the war was starting, when this campaign was especially emotional, it was a big battle for Malevich, which uh, uh, one of few battles which started before the war. Because uh, certain hot heads in Ukraine tried to prove that Malevich was a Ukrainian artist. Of course, this is more problematic because there are more claimants for Malevich, because Polish opinion could be different to Ukrainian and Russian opinion on this issue. But uh, we have to admit that Malevich uh, gave uh, ground to such uh, speculation by himself, because in his memoir, famous memoirs, uh, which he written under uh, the influence of Kharjiv. There is a famous phrase opening the uh, first part of this memoirs, I am Ukrainian, I love Sala. So, Malevich indeed loved Sala. Malevich um, indeed was born in Ukraine, but of course, qualify him as Ukrainian artist is overstatement. Uh, on the other hand, Malevich obviously is a part of Ukraine of the history of Ukrainian art because um, uh, in the late 20s he came to Kiev, uh, got professorship in the um, Kiev Art Institute uh, in the moment when in Russia he was ba basically uh, already was blacklisted. And uh, he spent uh, two years in Kyiv. He intensively published in uh, Ukrainian magazines. And of course, he influenced development of uh, Ukrainian visual arts in that period and was instrumental uh, figure for the Kyiv Art Institute. So what we are facing, we are trying to prove that our artists are our artists. Like, for example, Alexandra Exter, now is counted as Ukrainian artist in Ukraine. But you can open the Wikipedia and you can see interesting situation when in Ukrainian Wikipedia, Alexander Exter will be Ukrainian artist, in Russian Wikipedia, Russian artist, and in French Wikipedia, she will be French artist. Uh, so what I'm telling is that um, these battles are not necessarily very productive because my opinion and opinion which we are trying to, uh, let's say, not opinion, our conception on which we are basing our activities is that uh, we are interested in uh, artists who played role for development of Ukrainian art. He could, they could be in Ukraine for some period. Uh, they could be not born in Ukraine and uh, they did not die in Ukraine, but they were part on, of the local art scene for a certain amount of time and left an imprint on development of such art scene. Finally, the Ukrainian claim that uh, Ukrainian art was stolen by Russians uh, he has certain ground, but it was stolen not by Russians. This art was appropriated and stolen by international art market. And the story started already in uh, during the 1970s. 
Uh, it was a story of formation of market of Russian avant-garde, which was, uh, as you can imagine, um, basically smuggled from the Soviet Union. The market formed. It was a great interest to this uh, uh, type of art. The term Russian avant-garde was introduced and introduced by the market because uh, in the history of um, uh, Russian modernism, the word avant-garde was mentioned only two times, but by Alexander Benoit in one of his articles and by Punin in another article. But it was not never used by artists for self-identification because they were cubist, futurist, Cuba futurist, suprematist, constructivist, but not avant-gardist. And uh, of course, this uh, term could not originate in Russia in general, because in the Soviet Union, this word was reserved for different purposes. Uh, it was reserved because of the famous uh, Lenin saying that the Communist Party of the Soviet Union is the avant-garde of uh, proletarians. And of course, all these football teams and plans, which were called avant-garde, were not called avant-garde uh, in memory of Malevich, uh, as you can imagine. Uh, this term came into circulation during late 60s, early 70s in the West, uh, because um, uh, uh, in this moment, the article of Clem Clement Greenberg uh, avant-garde and kitsch was very popular, and it was nice to apply it to the strange modernism uh, coming from the former Soviet Union. Uh, initially, this market, at, at this market, this modernism was defined as the revolutionary avant-garde. Uh, that was still a time of the fashion for revolution, but in the 70s, the situation changed, and definition Russian appeared. And it became umbrella definition, embracing everything. Uh, even every, very often things which were A, not avant-garde, and B, not Russian. Uh, because demand was very high and supply was very low. By the 70s, works of Ukrainian artists such as Alexander Bogomazov, uh, Vasil Yermilov, are appearing in... Uh, Germany, France, later America, and usually packed in the package of Russian avant-garde. I can give you even an example. I think that I have it somewhere on the table. Because it's interesting how many exhibitions were, if I will find it in one touch, I will give you. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. This is, this, is, this is hysterical because uh, looking at the late exhibitions of Bagamazov, um, uh, I just hope that they can. Yeah. It's everything is coming to Russian art. Yeah. For example, uh, uh, this is style. Uh, Tuffling's Dream, a Russian Suprematism and Constructivism. Uh, exhibition in um, uh, 1973, which is including works of obviously Ukrainian artists, but um, just rebaptized into uh, Russian. Uh, uh, liberated cover in form, Russian non objective painting, Scottish National Gallery 78. Again, all Ukrainian artists which are becoming Russians. Um, uh, the Russian avant-garde from the collection of uh, Sackner in uh, America. Again, all Ukrainian artists were like Russians, 1983. And there is no end to this list. Uh, this model was created, of course, in that moment. Uh, as you can imagine, the uh, Soviet government did not take any part and he had no any influence on creation of these terms. But uh, uh, after the end of the Soviet Union, it was... 
Ну, много по тиктоку все слушают. Там можно все хоть до конца перечислить. Толку. Надо же делать. Excuse me. I can hear some sounds, but I did not understand where they are coming from. Uh, it resolved that the person muted themselves. Yeah, okay. Yeah, so uh, the story is that uh, after the end of the Soviet Union, this model of this great Russian avant-garde came back from the West to the East and was fully embraced and inherited in the um, uh, post-communist uh, Russian state. Uh, which, uh, of course, I'm understanding that it's creating, um, uh, like, making Ukrainians extremely unhappy and uh, creating this uh, oil in this campaign uh, to fight against appropriation. But so far, this appropriation uh, has, uh, in majority of cases, I can say, uh, Western roots. You probably uh, noticed and paid attention to a uh, very loud campaign for changing labels in uh, Western museums, uh, which, of course, the, the, the highest point of it, it was the uh, Beth with the Metropolitan Museum, which came too far. Uh, I think that even farther than it was asked for, uh, change in uh, um, labels on the works of uh, Kuinja and Ivazovsky, naming them Ukrainian artists, uh, provoking, of course, um, uh, negative public relations uh, reaction among Armenians and Greeks who started to claim their artists back. But uh, this is a parodical element, but in reality, uh, it's very interesting because in different European and North American museums, these labels were written in the most surreal form. Because in many of them, uh, artists died in uh, cities which did not exist by that time, or were born in the cities which were not named like uh, they were named later. A mixture, an absolute mixture of uh, and impossibility to divide Russian Empire, Soviet Union, post Soviet state uh, was manifested through basically all museums uh, uh, in the West, which is a general situation. It's a general situation of impossibility to divide. Um, uh, history in chunks to understand what was the Russian Empire and what was Soviet Union. I think that many of you uh, face this reality um, uh, in the West. On the other hand, uh, I want to address another issue because, um, uh, you know, only way to reclaim Ukrainian art, to my belief, is uh, to work painstakingly on the history of such art, because we still have a lot to do, which we are trying to do now, which we basically are writing this history from the scratch, because some things were done during the 30 years of independence, but still many things are uh, in front of us. But even in this undertaking, we are facing a problem which all of us will face. Uh, no difference from the what part of the former Soviet Union we are coming from. I'm talking about uh, methodological foundation for these decolonization efforts. Of course, we I can only agree with uh, old thesis of uh, Richard Pipes that the Soviet Union became continuation of the um, uh, old regime of the Russian Empire. But it's very specific continuation. And uh, if the Russian Empire, to my taste, is quite classical colonial power, uh, the issue which is uh, making mad uh, Mr. Lavrov and all Russian ideologists today. Uh, Soviet Union is uh, more specific. You know that contemporary Russian position now, we are talking about practically the um, uh, last probably seven, eight months, 
is to prove that the Russian Empire was a different empire. That it was an empire, but not as bad as British Empire. That Russia never had colonials. That uh, all uh, territories were just reunited with Russia and never conquered. And all this bullshit is repeated and repeated and again and again and again. Uh, it's uh, the Russian Empire is a classical uh, horizontal empire, which has um, uh, parallels and uh, analogous in uh, the history of the period. We can look at the Ottoman Empire, we can look at the Austro-Hungarian Empire. It's a classical empire. But when we come into the Soviet Union, we are facing problems. Because uh, I think that, uh, of course, it's obvious the imperialist power. There are no, the, the, no doubts about it. But it's a, a bit different model. And we have to come to the um, strong understanding of this model. Because only uh, having some uh, definitions, understanding, descriptions, we can apply um, uh, let's some instruments of the colonization to this situation. Uh, it's not a colonial model per se. We don't, we are lacking uh, literature, you know. There are some good books like, uh, let's say, um, uh, The Empire of Affirmative Action, etc., etc., but it's not enough. And the question is that through the history of the Soviet Union, this model is constantly changing, uh, which is um, uh, reflected in the um, um, in our history. You know, we still have, um, I think, that not close discussion about routization, or in Ukrainian case, Ukrainization. Because I, I want to say that Mr. Putin is uh, obviously wrong because the real creator of Ukrainian state was Comrade Stalin, who, <clears throat> and not Vladimir Ilyich Lenin, um, basically, basically accused in such a crime. Uh, and uh, of course, routization policy was not applied only in Ukraine, but for uh, let's say, establish a Ukrainian nation, it was instrumental. Uh, people are not understanding, uh, um, we have many falsification, I believe now, or emotional, non-historical description, because there are some, uh, people are not even looking at the roots of this policy. Because necessity of this uh, policy was not, um, uh, you know, to quiet, uh, nationalist feeling that was um, to destroy remains of the Russian old regime, which looked like uh, especially dangerous in that moment. So we have this. We have um, uh, internationalist period of the Bolshevik party and the growth of nationalism. We have uh, formation, like slow formation of um, uh, what is uh, called great power chauvinism, uh, which became like uh, a real constant of the um, Soviet Union uh, of the um, uh, post Second World War period. Uh, and uh, it's very interesting. So it's not very easy to apply to um, uh, our applied. Is a Said or Khalmi Baba. We need to create our own Said and our own uh, methodology. There are those of you who are following uh, current publications probably saw there are a few efforts from the Baltic states uh, to um, uh, create some kind of post colonial dis uh, discourse for, for clear so Soviet colonization of. Uh, these states, uh, but it's still not enough and not too much. Uh, because in Ukraine, we so far see emotions, and also we saw a lot of emotions, uh, but not um, uh, serious research in Central Asia. I'm talking about uh, Kazakhstan. They are making efforts. They have um, uh, 
academic programs uh, which are dedicated to uh, colonization of uh, Central Asia. Uh, it was quite a big problem, a program in Nazarbayev University. But still, we are not there yet. And in Ukraine, I don't see that it's already incorporated in the uh, uh, academia. No, now, of course, you can understand that we have a war in Ukraine. So it's uh, unfortunately we. Uh, don't have uh, possibilities to deal with this in a proper way, but this time will come because it's a, it's an extremely important issue and it's, it's extremely important to turn it into more serious direction, uh, which is uh, my true belief because uh, emotions are understandable, but uh, when uh, we are making Alexander Exter, Ukrainian artist, but still don't know what to do with Gogol. Uh, it's a bit of parody too. Uh, because uh, Gogol is an uh, enigma which we don't know how to approach. I didn't see too much of public attack on Gogol, finally. Uh, Count Leotov's story became uh, uh, more victimized than uh, great Russian Ukrainian or Ukrainian Russian artist uh, writer. So it's it's open book, it's open book. But uh, if you are interested in this um, uh, topic and you are trying to do something, I hope that you will be uh, successful finding answers to these questions and. Uh, I really believe that we are facing the formation of new discipline because, <clears throat> let's say, Central European and East European edition of uh, post-colonial studies will be quite different to the Western version, the Western version which we are observing now. So I think that uh, we can turn to questions. 